Good afternoon or good morning for some of you and welcome to the first Dementia Australia webinar for 2024. We really um, welcome you and hope that we um, provide some really interesting discussion today. So our topic today is making behaviour support plans work for you. And we have a, an all star cast um, for our first webinar. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Just before we start, I'd like to um, begin, of course, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I'm on Yorta Yorta um, land today. I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present and to our shared futures together. Just some really quick um, general housekeeping for those of you who have been to our webinars before, you know, but if you're new, um, you have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat and we really encourage you to do that and or to like questions that have already been posted and we have some people working in the background who will um, monitor those questions and feed those through um, to me. Unfortunately, because we only have an hour, we won't have a, a chance to answer all of your questions, but we'll certainly um, hope to answer a couple of them. I'd like to um, start just, we have um, uh, a pre-recorded message from Takaya Honda. Um, many of you I know will already know Takaya. Um, he's uh, very famous in the world of uh, film um, and um, television. Um, Takaya is one of the Dementia Australia ambassadors and has been working enormously um, hard to support and to um, promote the activities of Dementia Australia. So we'll just start with a very short um, introduction to um, from Takaya. Hi, my name is Takaya Honda and I am a proud Dementia Australia Ambassador. Thank you so much for dedicating your time today to improve your dementia specific training and behaviour support planning to give the best possible care. My mum, Rhonda, was diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's in her early 50s. Sadly, she passed away last August. She had spent time in care with myself, my dad and the rest of my family, but also in the care of those who work at her care home. And the people who there understood dementia, who got it a little bit more, who made the effort to get to know my mum a bit more, made all the difference in the world to us. So it makes a major difference for you to be here today and to be furthering your knowledge. And that knowledge not only helps people like my mum living with dementia, it helps people like me, the families, the loved ones, who can be assured that they're in safe hands. And trust me, it doesn't go unnoticed. We noticed every time the person who understood dementia that little bit more, who took that little bit extra time to take care of mum and make sure she's okay, lowering her stress levels because that lowered our stress levels. So enjoy the webinar. I hope you have a bit of fun all amongst the learning. And again, thank you. All of this helps not only people like my mum, but people like me. So thank you. Hi, my name is Takaya Honda and I am a Oops, <laughs> uh, and that was a wonderful message and we really thank Takaya for taking the time to put that together. It's so important to hear um, the voice of people living with dementia and certainly with their um, their carers and um, we get a whole different perspective and that will certainly be one of the themes that will um, bubble its way through our, um, our chat together this morning. First off, I'd like to introduce Robin Atto. Um, some of you will know Robin. Um, Robin is the Bupa Aged Care Dementia Specialist, and I believe that Robin has um, been involved in aged care and dementia support and, and uh, behavioural support plans for over 30 years. Um, I, I Yes, I'm similar, so <laughs> I, I, I feel the exhaustion sometimes, but thank you, Robin, for coming along. Robin, what I'd like just to ask first off is, just what has been the, the general um, aged care sector's experience of implementing and using behavioural support plans? Good question, Gary. I think um, I'll start with the history. I guess historically behaviour support plans were kind of generic and quite clunky. Um, and there was really poor regulation of restrictive practices. They were often separate from the behaviour support plan. 
Um, there were often words used like redirect and redivert, but there was really no fleshing out of what do we redirect and redivert that person to. They were not read or understood, um, and the importance of non-pharmacological interventions were not clearly um, identified in, in the behaviour support plan. The person with dementia was not seen as the central focus of the plan. Um, the plan was not developed in conjunction with them. Often it was developed by a, um, a, a registered nurse, um, families weren't involved. And then there was the change in legislation around 2021, where I guess um, all providers had to really lift their game in this area and look at how we can um, work and support the person with dementia. Putting those pieces of the puzzle together, um, things like knowing the person's history, being trauma aware, um, we at Booper have my day, my way, so how does that person like to spend their day? Having behaviour huddles where all of our um, carers and other lifestyle and wellbeing and even the maintenance man becomes involved in the development with the family and the substitute decision maker. Um, the plan becomes live. It's not just kept in a cupboard or on a computer. It becomes live and it's communicated to all of our um, frontline um, carers and also to the family um, become involved and active. So again, the, the plans are reviewed as well as part of Spotlight. So every month we will be reviewing the plans, making sure that the monitoring is in place. We're monitoring for any restrictive practices. We're seeing that as the plan really is effective, that we are reducing any restrictive practice, particularly chemical restraint in part of that fade out. Um, so I think also I'd like to finish with saying that understanding the activities as everyone's business and really promoting that. Um, you know, it's not just the lifestyle um, uh, staff who work with the resident with um, or the person with dementia. It is everyone from carers and moving away from that real task focused care to being, um, you know, partnering with family and partnering with the person with dementia and providing that robust, well read, well understood um, behaviour support plan. Look, thanks Robin, that's a really wonderful summary of, of some of the, I think the major themes that we want to return to again and again. Unfortunately, we only have an hour, but um, we could spend days talking about this and I know you'd love to, um, and I'd certainly love to be in conversation. One of the things I loved about what you were saying is that idea that, that these plans are not just a reaction. They're not just reactive documents, they're proactive documents. So the idea is that if we can capture that essence of, of who the person is and what's important to them, um, they will help us create an environment where effectively we don't need behaviour support plans, the person is appropriately supported. Um, so thank you for that. And we will, I will come back to you um, in a couple of minutes and, and just have a look at what some of the barriers have been in, in terms of your implementation of those programs. I'd like to um, move to Mari. Mari um, is one of the dementia advocates, so one of the wonderful um, family carers um, of somebody living with dementia um, who has also generously devoted enormous amounts of her time to supporting us at Dementia Australia. Um, Mari, I know that your husband had, was diagnosed with dementia, Lewy body and Alzheimer's disease um, in 2015, um, and you've supported him at a home and also supporting him within his residential aged care environment. I wonder if you can ex share with uh, us and the audience your experience of the development of the behaviour support plan for your husband. Thanks, Gary. Um, my husband, as you said, you know, um, was being cared for me at, at, at home um, for some seven or eight years after his diagnosis. Um, but when he began to have seizures with the Lewy body dementia, um, that facilitated the fact that he needed to go into a care facility. 
um, his behaviour support plan was was um, developed then in consultation with me, which was great, um, but also with him privately with a registered nurse so that he had the opportunity to speak without me being there to to um, be a critic or disagree or uh, what as it might be. Um, with his seizures, though, it can take him sometimes days, weeks to recover from them and he can have hallucinations and confusion and hyperactivity or prolonged sleep. And so it's really important in the behaviour plan that this, those um, changes mm -hmm. in him are, are recorded and noted because other times he is quite lucid, quite capable, mm -hmm. showering, eating, having a conversation. So it's the behaviour plan is important because that when those changes occur, um, he needs greater monitoring than he would normally. So it's important that, that the staff recognise there's kind of two aspects um, to, to him in that way. The other thing that I think is important about the behaviour plan, and um, Robin referred to this, is that it records aspects of their personality that make give the, um, the staff, the care workers, great insight into who they are. My husband is a, a very quiet person um, and his behaviour plan says he does not like confrontation, he does not like conflict, he likes his quiet time, he doesn't respond well to loud voices, um, he, he's never shouted at anybody in his life and, and those sorts of things can be really unsettling for him. But the behaviour plan says that, you know, one-on-one -on -one engagement, gentle reassurance, these are the strategies um, that work with him. Um, and I think that um, that's where working in partnership with the family is really important because we know these things. I've been married to my husband for nearly 50 years. Um, and so I know all of this about him. I know he likes his quiet times. I know he doesn't like confrontation. And so the care workers can learn a great deal from that. Um, and also, Robin referred to, you know, the reviewing of the behaviour plans, because obviously it is a progressive illness and it's most likely the next of kin or, or the family member who's going to start noticing the changes first. And um, so that's why um, I think the review of the plan is also a great, a great idea that it's a, a, um, it's a fluid document um, that changes as, as his needs change. Thanks, Murray. And look, I love that idea of the, of the fluid document. It, it, we all change. Our needs change, our interests change. Um, the person with dementia, obviously, ha, um, is experiencing a, a progressive condition. Um, their dementia will change their reserve, their, their capacity, I suppose, to, to um, respond to changes in the environment. Um, I, this is a throwaway question in some ways, Mari. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you describe how you were involved in the development of that plan at the facility? So what was the process, I suppose? Um, when he was um, first admitted, we had a long um, admission procedure um, the first day and then in the following days. Um, but I've found that the care coordinator in particular sought me out quite a bit in those first few weeks to try and talk about um, him and the things he liked and whether he was settling in and, it, the, it, and not just the care coordinator but other staff as well um, spent time talking to me to ask me these questions and took I, I guess the time to listen to me to say look he's not okay today, he's very anxious about this, or he is okay, or this is what is upsetting. So I guess it was that communication and openness for the staff to learn about him in those first few weeks um, to put the plan into place. But I know when I've read the plan that some of it happened without me being there because I wasn't aware of some of the things that he said, which I'll talk about later, yeah. Um. 
It's interesting. It's it's that idea of the of the family member being part of the care team, not being excluded. Your um your caring role and the, the centrality of the caring role of of a loved one doesn't stop because the person's been admitted to um, an aged care facility. Um, and I, I don't know, we we so often miss the richness of the carer's experience you know what's going on you know what triggers are you know what some of the support strategies are likely to be so you know i think sometimes we, we there's a danger that we miss that incredible resource um, and we've said this before in in webinars that it, it, dementia support is person-centered care um, it's not textbook care it's not like supporting somebody who's got a coronary disease where you can go to the textbook and it just gives you a, a clinical pathways of things that you can tick off that are going to support the person appropriate it's so individual and it changes so much from day to day so look thank you for for sharing that experience and again i will come back to you with some some other questions a little bit later robin back to you um Having heard from Mari and, and, and you having shared with us a little bit about the history, I suppose, of um, the development of behavioural support plans, I wonder if you can talk to us about the barriers from the, uh, the sector's side, if you like, mm -hmm. um, of engaging with consumers in the development of effective um, behavioural support plans. Like, I guess, um some of the barriers can certainly be um, both at the residential aged care level, but also in incorporating the resident um, with dementia into um, that behaviour support plan, hearing their story. So again, if our um, carers, our CCMs are not listening to that really rich life story mm -hmm. um, if the families are not engaged and involved and not all of our families are as wonderful as as Mari um, some are grieving some are you know not able to be as involved in care due to other issues so that can be a barrier to really developing a good support plan is not having that rich knowledge yeah um, I guess at the home level it's not understanding why the plan is so important so, you know, at, at the coal face, our, our carers utilising those strategies um, effectively, um, using the activities, monitoring, um, ensuring that uh, the activities that they're utilising to help to reduce those responsive behaviours are appropriate um, and useful. Um, and also having the education, so educating um, everyone around the behaviour support plans and ensuring that they, as I said before, activities are everyone's business, but so is the behaviour support plan implementation, making sure that it's regularly reviewed. Um, they can be some of the barriers, having that time to regularly review them um, and having that opportunity as well. So education, communication of the plan, and I guess also um, the not really understanding why it's so important and moving from that task focused care to that more individualized care. Thanks Robin. Uh, one of the um, comments I, I frequently hear when I'm in aged care facilities if I'm um, delivering education or um, talking to staff is well no I haven't read the care plan. I don't, I don't have time to read care plans. How would you respond to that um, fairly common response? Well, yes, that is a common response. And often when I go into um, our facilities, I will ask the carers who are working in the, particularly the dementia support communities, tell me about this person. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will then explain, well, if you can't tell me about the person, mm -hmm. then how are you actually working with that person to understand why you might be seeing some of these, um, you know, unmet needs and responsive behaviours. So. And I also say, well, if you haven't, if you've got time to battle with the person, particularly <laughs> during ADLs, um, then you've got time to understand who they are and do it a little bit differently. So, and where we do do it differently, we see the response and we see the change, and we can then see that you know reduction in the use of you know psychotropic medication and 
and we can see that the person doesn't change. A person with dementia doesn't change, but we change everything that we do around them to support them and for them to feel um, fulfilled and have their needs met. Absolutely, and it, look, it's one of my mantras, I have to say, um, that, that in dementia, small things can make a big difference. We don't have to know everything about the person. We don't need to know or read a, you know, a, a three volume um, autobiography of the person to know some of those essential things. And I know at Bupa that you use a, a program called My Day, My Way. Um, I've seen other programs with five things about me. Yeah. Uh, it really can be very, very simple and very um, not time consuming at all, um, just to have that key to engage with the person um, that we're supporting. Uh, and the other thing is, I think that a lot of these sort of programs, my way, my day, my way, or five things about me, can be made available to all staff. And again, before the webinar, we were uh, chatting that idea that that everybody has a responsibility. Everybody in an aged care facility or a, a community service has been employed to support people living with dementia. Whether you're working in um, hospitality, in environmental services, in reception, um, or your lifestyle, everybody has a responsibility. And and it's the the impact of all of those um, influence on the person with dementia. Just Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, please, sorry, we also have door signs and so mm -hmm. it's a very quick reference of what that person likes to do. So for our carers, they can just quickly look at the door sign or if I'm walking in, I know how I can engage with that person um, through just looking at those pictures. Yeah, absolutely. And mm. it's interesting because of course when you, we're living at home, our homes reflect that often. Ooh, the pictures and the ornaments and the sorts of way in which we've laid out our home give um, clues and, and cues about how to engage with me. And we're just mm. replicating that within the aged care environment. Mm. Thanks, Thanks for, for that, Robin. I'll introduce our, our third guest, but in a slightly different um, um, uh, role at the moment. So Amanda Eddy Lacey um, has been very heavily involved in um, uh, Ask Any, and we'll talk about Ask Any in a moment. But um, Amanda has also uh, been monitoring the questions that have been popping up in chat. So uh, Amanda, have there been any uh, interesting questions that you'd like to, um, to ask our panel? Thank you, Gary. Um, yes, I'm going by popular questions at the moment. So the most popular one is asking, if, is there any suggestions on helping care staff to move away from task based care? So which is one is that golden question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a golden question. Yeah. Um, and a whole other um, webinar, perhaps. However, I think it's really, really essential um, in this discussion. I might um, first talk, to, uh, ask Robin to comment on that and what that transition looks like. Um, and then I might throw to, to Mari and see what uh, her experience of that. Yeah, I think good, good question. And it really is, um, you know, it comes from the top. It really is how do we change our work instructions so that we're supporting our um, our carers to move from that task focused care. I mean, I'm a nurse. We all have that tick sheet that bowels, you know, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> opened. Um, but it is about setting up the environment, ensuring that we have activities. We use Montessori activities, particularly in our dementia support communities. Um, the education piece around why do we actually utilise those activities um, for our residents with dementia. Um, having occupation, meaningful occupation, so looking at what the person did in the past. So when the carer might have completed a task of showering, for instance, um, I don't like seeing them as tasks, I like seeing them as just a, a day, something to do in your day. Um, then the person with dementia can be set up with activities that they really like to do. So having the person with lots of activity in the environment, but also individualised boxes so that they can have their own sensory um, experience and that can be utilised during the day. Understanding the behaviour support plan is really important because the keys to what you might be using at certain times of the day to help reduce some of those responsive behaviours you might see are, the, are, are held within that behaviour support plan. 
And so it's really thinking outside the square, putting on that, you know, having those behaviour huddles, thinking outside the square, what can we do? What else can we use? What else can we do um, within the, the our, our day um, to reduce the task focus care and really increase the activities? Absolutely. Um, and I, knowing what a good day looks like exactly. for me, um, and it may not be, it may be getting up at six o'clock in the morning, shower, dressed, ready for ready for the day. That's not me personally. Um, <laughs> and you, you're going to have a battle getting me out of bed and, and, and dressed and showered. I need a coffee before, you know, I, I excuse me, I ease into the day. But but knowing those little details can, can make a huge difference, I think, in in that process. It's such a big task overcoming 50 years of aged care culture and unconscious culture where I'm going and I've worked in aged care so I'll, I'll own up to this going home and thinking I've had a good day I did six showers mm. well what about the residents well-being they're they're flourishing in in that process um, look and it is difficult it's really really difficult and there are many i think organizational interesting organizational barriers to that shift in in task focus um, but we might be a good topic for a, a further a future um, a webinar i think thanks robin um, murray have you got any suggestions about that from a from a family carer's perspective um well first of all i'm i'm very sympathetic of, of care workers because i know what their day the, <laughs> how busy their day is and how unpredictable it can be and so what we might like in theory we we know can't always play out but i do think there's there's a couple of things you know one is you can deliver a cup of tea in a number of ways yeah um and the task can include some connection you know a 30 second minute whatever of a connection with the person the other thing is um in my husband's care facility now there's lifestyle activity seven days a week and i'm finding that's making a huge difference yeah. to him and to and to the other residents because the weekends were just a terribly lonely time um, and um, and I think also the the um, lifestyle coordinator and the activities that they do, getting to know which residents like which activities, which ones they'll say no to. Um, I think that's all um, part of the um, care, the care plan. If we're coming back to the support plan, mm -hmm. under getting to know what they're like as a person, and then that flows over into the sort of activities that they're willing to do, and then what sort of activities are programmed that are the popular ones with um, residents. So, thank you. Look, and again, we come back to that theme of knowing the person and 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 being up to well. And as I think Robin was saying, capturing that and sharing that in a in an effective way for busy busy staff look one of the things that popped into my uh, mind while both you and, and robin were were chatting was that the idea that we we're not going to change the sector overnight and change you know 50 60 whatever years of of practice and i think sometimes that the danger is that we feel a little bit of um I don't know, disappointment, if not a feeling of defeat around that. And one of the things we talk about at Dementia Australia all the time is that is the the power of those small moments. It, you know, I, I may be engaged in what many people would call a task. So it's assisting somebody's hygiene, showering them, but it's how I engage in that task as much as the task. You know, the opportunity to have a, a short conversation if I know that the person loves yachting or something or other using that information from the um, my day my way or five things about me as a way of connecting you know our lives um, are full of those tiny moments of connection and, and that's what for me anyway uh, creates that sense of of connection of well-being um, we don't have to change the whole way we do things in order to um, utilize those, those small moments 
OK, um, Amanda, I think we've probably got time for another quick question from the um, from participants. If there's one, sorry to jump on you or to jump that at you. Um, it, was there anything that that came up as well? Yes, there, there's actually quite a quite a few questions here, but I was thinking about. Somebody asked a question around the home and community care sector. Mm -hmm. So um, what kind of support is available um, to help people who are living in the home and commu in community who don't have a lot of family support? So how can we support them with their Thanks, behaviour Amanda. plans? Thanks, Amanda. Robin, I'll throw that to you. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I guess there's a number of, um, I mean, I think Amanda will talk shortly about um, the Ask Any app, but, you know, there's a number of um, resources available through Dementia Australia. I think um, certainly there are um, other organisations in the community like um, Dementia Support Australia who can assist. Um, we have a 24 hour helpline. Um, so, it's, it's really finding those resources that are in the community to support um, the person. I know previously, in a previous life, I've worked in a team called the, um, the RSP, um, Residential Support Program, but also we would work in the community, go into homes and work with um, closely with families in the development of those plans as well. So there are resources out there. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about those resources. Gary? Look, we might talk <laughs> about those, I think, a little bit later when yeah, we right. um, um, speak to Amanda more about the Ask Any. Look, it yeah. is. I think it is a challenge in the community yes. uh, community care sector. Um, we're often in for, for, for fairly brief periods of time um, and often quite focused amount of time and it can be shared uh, difficult to share some of that information with uh, workers in the, the community sector. So it does present some unique um, challenges, I think. Um, but I think some of the basic principles of knowing the person, building that relationship with family, if it's possible. I know the questioner sort of mentioned that, that often we don't have that information. Um, one of the things I find often, just really briefly, is that people, residents, people living with dementia, if we're observant, if we're um, curious, they tell us all the time about what's important to them. They tell us through what they do as much as through what they say. Um, and again, sometimes it's just that that slow process of, of capturing information about what works and what doesn't work, what engaged the person, what didn't engage them. Um, and again, that critical um, um, aspect of that, which is sharing that information. Thanks for that. Uh, I'd like to move on now just uh, briefly. We have a, a pre-recorded um, chat. Janet Anderson, who's obviously the Commissioner for the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, um, uh, very, very kindly, and she's an extraordinarily busy woman at the moment and all the time in, in the aged care um, sector, um, was very kind to uh, record a brief uh, video for us just discussing from her perspective and the, the Commission's um, perspective um, some of the important features of um, the behavioural support plan. So we'll just play that video now. Hello everyone. My name is Janet Anderson and I'm the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner and I've been asked to say a few words about behaviour support planning, which I'm very pleased to do. It's well recognised that people living with dementia can experience behavioural and psychological symptoms that can include confusion, depression, anxiety, agitation, even aggression. And these are sometimes called challenging behaviours. And if you work in aged care, you're very familiar with these. In decades past, caring for these individuals often involved restraining them, whether that was by physical means or mechanically, chemically or even environmentally. But as a society, we've come to understand that restraining individuals as a way of managing their behaviour is not treating them with dignity and respect and is certainly not respecting 
their human rights. And of course, there's a special case that can be made for the use of psychotropic medication, particularly where individuals are diagnosed as having a mental health disorder, which would respond favorably to psychotherapeutic treatment. But coming back to restrictive practices used for managing behavior, there's a better alternative, and it is now overwhelmingly supported by the evidence. And that alternative is behavior support. This is so readily and widely acknowledged as best practice that there are now legal requirements on aged care providers to have behavior support plans in place for every older person in care who has a restrictive practice considered or implemented or used as part of their care. Behaviour support planning, when it's done well, can improve the care and services that an older person receives and enhance their well-being and quality of life. And one of its key aims is to avoid inappropriate or unnecessary restrictive practices. A good behaviour support plan can support frontline staff to provide person-centred care that will enhance an individual's quality of life. And Preparing and documenting this plan for and sometimes with an individual not only helps to proactively support that older person, but also to reduce the risk of harm to themselves and to those yes. around them. And staff benefit too. Having an up to date behaviour support plan available and accessible to all staff can reduce the stress or anxiety that some staff might feel when they're unsure how to support an older person when that individual is distressed or showing change behaviours. The plan helps staff to respond to a change behaviour in a meaningful and controlled way that is going to deliver better outcomes for that individual and a better experience for everyone. Now, I could go into a lot of detail about the characteristics of a good behaviour support plan, but that's actually for others to address in this session. So I will limit uh, my comments to a couple of observations. Firstly, a generic or standard behaviour support plan is of little, if any, value to the individual or to staff. Inclusion of strategies such as redirect or reassure or warm drink, just as uh, 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 words on a page are typically fairly unhelpful if they don't uh, have alongside them more information. For example, redirect them from what? How? Reassure them how? What are they? What are they anxious, fearful, or concerned about? What hot drink do they like? And does this actually make a difference? Can they be given a particular food or drink at a certain time to prevent them from becoming hungry or upset later on? And of course, staff may interpret a generic strategy in the wrong way or in a way that has been tried and failed before, which might even make the behaviour worse. Second point I want to make is that longer is not better. Very long behaviour support plans can be repetitive and often contain unnecessary extraneous detail that uh, and the, uh, a long plan is not likely to be read by busy staff in any event. And also a behaviour support plan must be accessible to staff. If they're hard to find, they're never going to be used in practice and you might as well not bother. So a long generic behaviour support plan stored online somewhere which is not specific to an individual and their current needs and preferences is a waste of time. It will not be effective. It will not help staff to identify and create opportunities to improve a person's quality of life and their quality of care and may actually increase the likelihood of a restrictive practice being used inappropriately. People reading the behaviour support plan need to be able to get a very clear picture of who the person is, what the behaviour looks like and what staff need to do or how staff need to behave to support that older person. It should include strategies that predict needs and wants and dislikes and actions that can then be taken to prevent unwanted behavioural responses. I'm keen for as many aged care staff as possible to be involved in developing behaviour support plans because it's by having that experience that staff can build their confidence in preparing and 
using behaviour support plans that will deliver better outcomes for older people. The impact of a good behaviour support plan on an individual living with a cognitive impairment can be life changing. I hope you'll get on board. Thank you. And again, we'd, we'd love to um, thank Janet for taking the time out of a busy schedule to share that. Some really, really interesting points. Again, picking up a number of the points that we've already um, just addressed briefly. But I, I like that idea of, of detailed, but not too, too detailed um, and the right detail. And again, I think that's something that Mari and, and Robin have both um, commented on. Um, we don't need to know everything about the person. It really is some key features that can make that critical difference in the person's well-being, their sense of connection. Um, and also that one of um, Janet's famous um, lines, and she almost used it in that video, was um, a behavioural support plan, not just a cup of tea. It may be a cup of tea, but it's not just a cup of tea. It's when and how and um, does it work? Perhaps it doesn't really work in the afternoon or if we've left the, the person with dementia's behaviour, we're not supporting their behaviour until they've got to the point where they're really quite distressed and it's too late for a cup of tea. That will just make things worse. So some of those critical elements in a, in a good behavioural support plan, um, being able to share those things. So once again, thank you to, to Jeanette for um, sharing that information with us. Mari, I quickly, oh, just before I, I move on to you, Mari, um, sorry, um, I need to talk to Amanda. I've lost my place in my um, run sheet here. Um, I'd like to introduce um, formerly Amanda Eddie Lacey. Amanda has worked for over 20 years um, in the aged care sector in a number of roles and um, for the last, last number of years has worked with Dementia Australia and with the um, uh, Centre for Dementia Learner, Learning. She's been involved most recently in developing some of uh, the behavioural modules for the Ask Annie app and we'll more about that in a moment. Um, but I'd just like to hand over to um, Amanda just to tell us a little about that, the development of the Ask Annie app what triggered it, what is it, um, and how can we use it? Hi, thank you, Gary. Um, yes, so basically it was after um, hearing the order from um, Commissioner Anderson, and after we learnt about the high level of the non-compliance of many providers regarding the behaviour support plans, it motivated us to try and find some solution to support aged care to improve how they provide behaviour support for people living with dementia. So before we did develop this course, we did put out a survey to find out um, what the aged care, sorry, aged care staff felt that they needed, um, what was their current level of knowledge, their confidence, their skills, where that was at in regards to behaviour support plans, and um, basically asking them how, how did they interact with them. We also invited aged care staff to participate in the focus groups. And the results that we got from that were quite interesting in that majority of the staff who did complete the survey were registered staff and they claimed that they felt confident in their knowledge about behaviour support plans. Most of them claimed that they knew all they, all they needed to know about behaviour support plans and that the training they had already received was sufficient. Uh, there was also a high level of agreement that the strategies in the behaviour support plans were not effective for the person. so that refers to that generic type of strategies that um, are in the behaviour support plans. And um, there was a high level of agreement that they felt that those who they worked with would benefit from further training. So it was a bit of a mixed bag in our sort of data results there. In um, our focus group discussions, um, care workers informed me that it wasn't really their job to do anything in regards to behaviour support plans and that mostly all things related to behaviour support plans were to do with the nurses. So this sort of led to the development of planned behaviour support to provide staff with um, information that will help them to understand that uh, behaviour support is an ongoing process that requires everybody to be involved in and how that they can contribute to the overall plan, um, which 
As we know, if it's done effectively, it will improve the quality of support provided to people living with dementia who are experiencing change behaviours. So I've got a little um, share screen to, to sort of go through. Can everybody see my screen at the moment? So, we can, yep. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so just in, in developing the course, I was guided by the consideration that behaviour support is about the actions taken to understand what the person's needs are and what are those actions to then identify ways to support those needs. So in doing that, there were three modules in the planned behaviour support course. And so they um, include identify, assess, plan, implement and evaluate. This follows the Dementia Support Australia's behaviour support plan framework that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. In the first module, identify, um, this offers methods to identify change behaviour. All the lessons in there help users to recognise what a change behaviour is, be mindful of how they initially respond to a change behaviour, what type of documentation is required and what to document, and to know if the behaviour is a new or a known behaviour and how to respond in both incident, inst instances, excuse me, and of course um, communicate these changes with the team. The next slide. <laughs> so the, the, the learning in the assess module, which is the second module in the course, um, this helps staff to understand what information is important when, in, when attempting to understand the change behaviour and identify meaningful support strategies that goes into creating the effective support plans. This is about gathering um, that information that Mari was talking about that is individual and specific to the person. They learn methods on how to gather that information and all that that all staff have a role in um, and responsibility in contributing and that their contribution also means a more complete and meaningful behaviour support plan that all staff can interact with to support the person living with dementia. And so there was a large gap leading to the non-compliance for providers when it came to monitoring and evaluation. And the lessons in the planning behaviour support course helped staff to understand that this process, what this process is and how it is done to inform the behaviour support plan so that it not only meets the legislative requirements, but also supports staff to provide quality support that is person-centred. Uh, the lessons in the last module, which is plan, implement and evaluate, support staff to understand how to utilise this information to start developing behaviour support strategies that are meaningful to the person and then implement them, but then also to monitor them to see if those strategies are effective. The course uses short scenario based learning to help the staff learn how to apply actions that are required to provide good behaviour support and then to improve the quality of care provided to people living with dementia and, and also meet the legislative requirements. So we've introduced branch scenarios. They're a new addition to the platform, to the Ask Annie platform. And this is where staff can make decisions and experience the consequences of those decisions in a very safe space. Um, these are the practice activities in the planned behaviour support course, which is now available free of charge to all care staff. So that's that's it from me um, in regards to the course. So thank you, Gary. Oh, great. Thank you, Amanda. And, and thank you for um, letting people know that we weren't just selling stuff, that this um, program is um, now freely available. And I'm, I'm sure that many people in the audience um, were, are considering how they could or their staff members could use the Ask Any app. We just just displayed a QR code. If you scan the code, that'll take you to a site where you can download the app for free. So there are a number of different modules. As Amanda was saying, they're, um, they're very short, almost micro um, learning. Um, they're not going to take a lot of time, um, but it can be a really good introduction to a range of topics within dementia um, support. Uh, and just to, to mark today's launch, um, we're really delighted that we'll be able to offer to two very lucky individuals who have um, logged into the webinar today free access to the Centre for Dementia Learning's Dementia Learning Hub for two for one year for two individuals. So two people will win a year's access to the hub. I'd also just quickly like to extend our gratitude to our platform partner, the people who helped us develop the Ant, um, Ask Annie, um, which is the Gandell Foundation, as well as our module partners um, for planning behaviour support. 
um, Aged Care Research and Industry Innovation Australia and the Rosemary Norman um, Foundation. Um, so we're really grateful for those people who again very generously have um, enabled us to offer this um, education um, to uh, our aged care workers across Australia. Um, as we said from today, the Ask Any Out is free to anybody who wants to um, have a look. Um, so we really strongly encourage you to um, just have a look, download and have a look and see how it may assist you. Now, getting back to our um, main topic, I suppose, which is I, I'd just like to again throw to Mari. Um, from your experience as a family carer and seeing that transition of your husband from being supported at home to being supported in the aged care um, sector, what did you notice was the impact of a well executed, a read, well written, well read, well executed behaviour support plan on your husband? Um, thanks, Gary. Um, in the early stages of um, his diagnosis, um, he said to me that what dementia had robbed him of was his confidence and that without me, he'd be really frightened of the future. Um, and the first line in his um, behaviour plan, and I wasn't there when, when he said this, when they asked him what is a good day, his response was, when I get to speak to my wife on the phone, that's a good day. Um, and when care workers recognise that the major cause of his anxiety is his separation from me, that he worries about where I am um, and sometimes he, he thinks something's happened to me or he can't find his credit card or um, can't remember where he's parked the car, all of yeah. those things are worrying, but he's not going to take somebody else's word for it. It's going to be, I'm the only one <laughs> that he can trust. Um, yep. So, um, and from the from the um, the care plan, you know, it, it's it's quite simple. When he hears my voice and I say to him, everything's okay, it's a one or two minute chat, it's all yep. over and he's calmed down, everything's all right and I can hear the relief um, yeah. um, in his voice. And even though I'm visiting probably five out of seven days a week, there's still times when he becomes anxious about something and needs to talk to me. Um, um, he does have medication prescribed for him at, for times when he's really anxious, but he doesn't need it usually if he's spoken to me. That's the key. That's, you know, um, I'm the, the key to calm him down. And, and a lot of his care workers recognise that. Um, and I think that um, what Gary, what you've said and Robin said and, and Janet said is it's about simplicity. There's lots of things in his care plan that I referred to before, but it's that first line, you know, right? when he, what's a good day, let me talk to my wife. Um, and anyone who cares for him, who understands that connection between him and I, then, um, and recognises it, then that's really the key to him. You know, that's the key to his happiness and his feeling of safety. Um, and um, it also helps me because if I hear his voice, then I know, well, okay, somebody cares enough to let him ring me um, and just says, okay, just, just talk to Mari and it'll settle everything down. And um, as he said, it's a good day. It's a good day when he talks to me, but it's probably also a better day for the staff because he's settled down. Um, he's not looking for, you know, some reassurance from me, a quick phone call and um, and he's fine. So I think that, you know, I'm just reinforcing what everybody's already said. It doesn't have to be onerous. Um, it doesn't have to be long winded. It's read the first line of his, his plan and you'll get him, you know, that's it. So. And Mari, I think you really picked up on the um, the title for our webinar today, which is making behaviour support plans work for you. And you is everybody involved. You is the person with dementia. You is the the staff member. You is or are sorry, my grammar's a bit off today. You is the um, the family member. 
um, uh, because a well-written, well-constructed, well-communicated and well-executed um, uh, behaviour support plan, it benefits everybody involved. And, and I think that's a really, it's not just a, 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 another onerous piece of paperwork if we um, if we dedicate the time um, to, to constructing them well. And again, hopefully the uh, Ask Any um, behaviour module will provide people with some extra supports around that. I might ask uh, Amanda if there are just any more questions from the audience that we might be able to quickly address before we finish for today. Oh, Gary, there's a plenty of really <laughs> great questions in there. Excellent. So, I'd love to see the people um, engaged. Yes. So choosing which one. Um, so I am going with um, the popular ones. Yep. Um, and so there are some really relevant points pulled up, but I'm going to talk about the confidentiality. So yeah. are behaviour support plans shared with non-clinical staff, for example, maintenance and cleaning staff? Um, and are there confidentiality issues with this? Or when you talk about ensuring everyone knows the support strategies required, is this via strategies such as door signs that you referred to? So basically we're talking about how do we communicate to people what people's needs are? I love that question. I've just had a discussion in an aged care facility just today, in fact, about um, from with the chef saying, well, I don't know anything about this stuff and you want me to engage with the residents. So very, very apt question. And Robin, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> what are some of your comments about who we share with? What are the, again, barriers, I suppose, to sharing some of this information? Mm, I guess, uh, you know, uh, I think sometimes we can utilize everyone working in the in the facility to be part of that development of the plan. And I've known in one case the maintenance man was the person who the the person with dementia that I was working with just loved and he used to shadow him and they'd go outside and so he did because he was a relevant person who was working very closely with um, with this gentleman need to know that, you know, some of the triggers that he might have. Um, I guess it's also about asking the substitute decision maker as well and the resident, um, you know, who would you like this, this shared with? We do work as a team in residential aged care. Um, we do know that the information that we are sharing needs to be in relation to the resident and in relation to their care. Um, and if the person involved is involved in their care, then they need to know what they need to do as well. So there's a whole lot of the probably little nuances there as well, but I think certainly asking asking the family, asking the resident, um, and we do want our, um, you know, all of our, um, our carers, our maintenance men, everyone involved in the development, if they have a very great relevance to that person. Um, and and we'll have to we'll use strategies that are, are relevant as well. Thank you. And I think the idea that duty of care, privacy, all of these sorts of sometimes they're furfies, I have to say, um, that they're not necessarily a complete barrier to sharing this um, information with the relevant support people in within an organisation, we can work with some of those um, challenges. It might also be like we have the door signs, so it may be, and we do educate everyone mm -hmm. that, you know, this is the person, this is what they mm -hmm. like. Um, so it may not have to go into that absolute detail, but so long as they know enough about the person, and sometimes it's a maintenance man, as I said, who knows everything about the yes. person. Um, and someone who's working 24 seven with them may not even know where they were born or what they their occupation was. So it is it is about that. <laughs> Indeed. Look, thank you, Robin, for for those comments. And I'm just aware of the time. So look, I we could discuss uh, this topic until about four o'clock next week, I would imagine. Um, but hopefully that we've been able to address some of the issues, answer some of the questions from the, the audience who are listening in today. I really want to thank everybody who's been involved in today's um, webinar. Um, Takaya Honda, um, the Commissioner, um, Janet Anderson, certainly 
certainly to you, Robin, for um, spending your time. I know you're having a very, a very busy day and a very behavioural support plan focused day. So thank you um, to Mari again. Um, hearing the voice of of carers and people living with dementia makes for me this whole process real. Um, it's not just about filling in the documents. It's about real people, the real lives and real experience. So thank you so much for your um, generosity today. Um, to Amanda, very um, kindly um, uh, came along and shared her experience developing the Ask Any app and, and dealt with all of the multitude of questions. Um, uh, to uh, the team in the background, to um, Jim and to uh, uh, Taylor and to Vicky. Um, thank you all. It, it takes a, a village to run a, a webinar, I have to say. Um, really, really thank you all um, as uh, audience participants. And uh, we look forward to your um, participation in our next webinar, which is on April the 12th. Um, we will post a link to the, the recording of this um, webinar um, in a few days, so you'll be able to um, direct your friends and colleagues if you found the webinar of use. Thank you all so much, um, and we look forward to seeing you again in April.